And so now we're going to talk about the role of money actions. Um, and we're going to have to talk about some details, and some people get overwhelmed by some of those details. It's, so why it's important to we want to take a look at some of those details. Um, and so I want to give the overview first. And so we're going to ask the question, the outset, how much particular money is spent on campaigns and elections? And also, how much money does it cost to win? Because that's going to actually um, reveal some important the linkage between money and uh, campaigns and elections. So to start out with, we have how much money is spent on elections. And to answer that question fully is a little bit harder than you think, and, and that will become clearer when we get to the final section of this lecture where we talk about ideas of super PACs and the idea of dark money. And that is that super PACs that are organizations that are set up to advocate for a particular uh, individual running for office are often able to withhold information about how much money they have on hand and how much money they've actually spent in support for a particular candidate. And so the total amount of money that is spent for um, a particular election or election cycle is harder to do, it's harder to figure out. And that's a bit of a problem because if money is attempted influence over the political outcomes, then we should have better information about that. So we can take a look at direct the money that individuals spend themselves, that the, the candidates themselves have given to themselves to run their campaign, as well as the contributions they have gotten, direct contributions they've gotten from individuals, from corporations, from political action committees, etc. And so when you take a look at that, that you have in 2018, the congressional races combined was $5.7 billion was spent running candidates for office for the House of Representatives. For all 430, 435 members of the House of Representatives, it cost $5.7 billion for all of those candidates to run and all the buttons they put, all the consultants they hired, all the campaign ads, all the focus groups they ran. So all their expenditures was $5. The presidential election in 2018, the two major political parties, plus some of the minor ones combined, spent $2.4 billion in 2016 running for President of the United States. And so when you say things like millions or billions, you can make it sound like a huge amount. And it's hard to figure out whether or not that is a big amount that was spent. But one way of putting in perspective is Procter & Gamble, which is this uh, multinational corporation that has Pampers, Oral-B, Secret, and a whole bunch of household products that we know and love had an advertising budget in 2017, an annual budget of $4.4 billion. So for some, when you seven billion for all these congressional races or 2.4 billion for the uh, president of the United States, it sounds like a lot of money and to be able to raise that kind of money and spend that kind of money is something we should pay attention to. But on the other hand, if it costs that much for the advertising budget of Procter & Gamble is $4.4 billion, some people argue we're not spending enough money for something so important as who the President of the United States is going to be, who's going to control the House of Representatives, who's going to control the U.S. Senate. So it is certainly a lot of money. The way in which uh, the money is raised is something we have to ask, and the chapter does a good job of, of doing that. So it's not just these lectures, but also the um, chapter itself to figure that out. What we also want to think about is not simply how much money it costs to raise, how much money in aggregate, but how much money does it cost to win? Compare the average amount of money that the average winner spent and how much the average challenger spent and to see whether or not there is a difference. And what you see here on the slide is that there is a clear difference. And the House represents 2014. It was $1.5 million. The average winner for the House of Representatives seat spent $1.5 million. The average loser spent $258,000 for a 6 to 1 advantage. In 2018, the average winner spent $1.8 million to win, and the average loser spent $441,000 to lose. And that's a 9 to 2 advantage or a 4.5 uh, time advantage to the winner. And that's a considerable amount. Uh, for the U.S. Senate in 2014, it was $12.1 million. The average winner spent and the average loser spent $1.2 million. It's a 10 to 1 advantage. And then uh, in 2018, $15.6 million to win. $2.1 million was the average spent by the average loser. That's 15 to 2 advantage or 7.5 times more money was spent by the winner. 
So in that sense, for the House and the Senate, it's pretty clear that the uh, members of the House and members of the Senate, that those who have the most money and spent the most money are the ones who are going to get reelected. But as we had said, the people who have the most money are also the incumbents. Part of the reason why they have so much money is that they're incumbents. And part of the House of Representatives and members of the U.S. Senate are running for re-election from the first day of after they have won their election. They're still raising money. Their activities in the House and the Senate are ones that are allowing them to demonstrate what sort of goodies they can deliver to their districts, what sort of goodies they can deliver to particular corporations that matter for their district, and things like that. And so, again, it is hard to separate entirely how much is incumbency and how much is money because they point in the same direction. But we clearly see that the general trend is for the House and for the Senate, for the legislature, you see that those candidates who have the most money and spend the most money are the ones who win. And none of this is all that surprising. I don't think any of you on an exam will say, oh, the people with the less money, the least amount of money are going to win elections. So there's nothing that's there but the magnitude of the advantages. Um, for the President of the United States, it's less clear. So in 2016, Hillary Clinton spent $1.4 billion and Donald Trump $957 million. Uh, $957 million. So it's basically a draw. Um, in that sense, money doesn't determine who's going to get elected, although Hillary Clinton got the most popular vote. So again, we have the one who gets the most votes is the individual who uh, spent the most money. So it does follow that trend. But in terms of the ways in which the U.S. Constitution decides it, it is the winner of the Electoral College who was elected president of the United States. So generally speaking, we can say the candidate who spends the most money wins. There are some exceptions. We have one here in California in the governor's race in 2010. Uh, Jerry Brown, who became uh, the governor in 2010, spent $35 million on his campaign and ran against Meg Whitman, who spent $140 million. Most of it was her own money that she just gave to herself because she had moved on from being a CEO and said, what do I want to do next? I'd like to be governor. And people disagreed with her ideas. So it is not the case that Every single individual who spends the most money will get elected, but the trend is incredibly strong. So on average, the average winner has a huge advantage because of the money that they have on hand. That money allows them to pay for the campaign ads, allow them to hire the strategists, allow them to hire the speechwriters, buttons, and all the different paraphernalia that's necessary to run a campaign. And that leads to greater success for those who have more money on hand.